Welcome to Scoop Road Order. Happy Tuesday. First day of spring practice. No pads on today, but the guys are running around a little bit in shorts, getting some work in. Uh, got a nice little report about what happened after the media left, which is actually important. So we're going to break uh, some of that down, some of the movement that we saw and heard about. Uh, really excited to see how this offensive line shakes out. The quarterback derby, uh, as of this moment, is, I think, a little closer than people expected. It's one day. Obviously, a lot can happen uh, through August. Um, but a lot of moving parts and a lot of predictability. Uh, again, we went through the whole lineup last night and basically nailed everything. So um, I think we're in good shape uh, with our predictions and our sources. So we're going to get into all of that. As always, we appreciate you guys. Uh, this Again, the Paid Forward has been an awesome program. I actually have to sign someone up tonight. Uh, you know who you are. I'll give you a call after the episode. Sorry, I did not get to you earlier today. I've been slammed all day. Uh, but I appreciate you guys supporting Pay It Forward um, with the Super Chats. Again, if you have a question, uh, send us a Super Chat. We will answer it happily. Uh, if you guys enjoy this content and this uh, broadcast that we do, uh, please uh, click the subscribe button. Also click like. Also click the little alert bell so you get an alert when we go live. Again, we love seeing these audiences in here. It's great always seeing familiar faces, uh, answering questions, the chat. Uh, being handled by the Wrench Brothers, uh, Akeem. Uh, you know, we appreciate you guys both so much. Akeem and Devin always uh, handling business and making sure the chat is nice and clean. So make sure you thank those guys. They do a great job, along with my uh, wife, Kim, who's also in here, uh, while she takes care of our two little rugrats. So I appreciate you guys uh, tuning in. Uh, shout out where you guys are watching from. Shout out who you guys are watching with. And if you guys love spring football and love Ohio State football, and want to be the greatest Ohio State fan who's ever lived, Join BuckeyeScoop.com. It is an absolute riot right now, and it is a nonstop action. Uh, I love being on the board, especially this time of year, because people overreact to everything, and it is absolutely hilarious. And uh, it's just a fun crowd. It's a great crowd. Uh, some of the best people in the world, uh, some of the best friends you'll ever meet are on BuckeyeScoop.com. So join it. If you guys have not been in a message board, uh, take the dive. And if you have any questions, uh, shoot me an email at Barton, B-A-R-T-O-N, period, 145 at gmail.com that is my email and i'd love to answer any questions you guys have so i appreciate you guys as always tuning in going to bring in my good friend nevada buck nevada um you know the media was in there for 30 minutes again they get to watch the stretch period and watch uh the beginning of individual which is basically the most worthless periods of the entire practice so again uh Ohio State will never change they'll always let these guys watch as little as possible uh kind of um it's like uh, you know the Oliver Twist bagging for the porridge, standing there. May I please have some more, please? And it's just like, you know, the coaches don't show anything provocative. But once they left, there was some interesting movement um, or along the offensive line, along some of the rotations. Um, and I think that's going to be the exciting thing. And we're going to break some down on BuckeyeScoop.com probably in the morning. Uh, but we've got some really good stuff to talk about. Uh, day one thoughts, Nevada. Devin Brown obviously ran uh, with the first crew. Uh, that was expected just because of the familiarity with the offense and I think that that's the right thing to do to give the the guy um you know he was here last year uh paid his dues guy you recruited give him some work but you know Will Hire's gonna get a lot of work with the ones and he's still the guy that I you know likely project as the starter but I think Devin's gonna go down fighting and I think it's gonna be a, a really close competition your thoughts on uh what you heard about the first day of spring football well the first thing is just don't believe everything that you see or don't believe everything that you hear because uh, it, it is kind of a, a hall of illusions with Ohio State. And they do like to kind of throw off one thing and to kind of head fake you and kind of move you to other things. So don't read too much into where guys started in the first 15 minutes or who was ahead of whom or things like that, um, because that is always, you know, it, it's political. There's messages being sent and sometimes they just don't want to have stuff kind of get out there so um as a fan as, as a smart fan as an educated fan as a non overreactive fan just uh, don't believe everything you see we'll break that down a little bit more for you as we kind of get into this but uh you know sometimes what you see isn't isn't what you're gonna get uh, that's the first thing second thing boy we have some strapped up dudes and and i don't want to come off like Kirk curb street you know, oozing over taylor mays talking about how he looks so good in the uniform and stuff like that. But man, we, we have some kids that look good in the uniform and uh, like, wow. Uh, it's a, uh, it's a physically imposing group of players. And um, you know, for Ohio state, 
you know, th- does that mean everything? No, I'm some of the most physical imposing dudes or, you know, what's the old, uh, looks like Tarzan plays like Jane. Um, you know, that, that doesn't necessarily, you know, uh, translate to on-field success, but there's some guys that are really good players that came in looking <laughs> in really good shape. And that generally does equate to good success. So, uh, I think that was kind of my overall impression was kind of the jaw dropping athleticism with this Ohio state team. And, um, um, it's something to see if you haven't seen it yet, you know, go to YouTube, look some pictures of it. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty stunning in terms of seeing some of these kids, you know, kind of going out there and what we're going to be rolling out, um, in college football in 2024. And, uh, the, the last thing that kind of struck me um, on day one is just how at peace, at total peace, Chip Kelly seems with being the offensive coordinator at the Ohio State University. Um, you know, he talked about how, you know, his wife says she hasn't seen him this happy in years and he's back to doing what he loved. And I'm telling you, I've got some exceptional Chip Kelly sources, some guys that are really, really close to Chip. And they they have said, you know, since this whole thing announced, they're like, do not be surprised if Chip stays there longer than you think. And I'm like, oh, I figure this might be a you know, cup a year type of situation. They're like, no, I, I really think for Chip, this could be a lifestyle change where he goes and sets up camp and um, he could be there for a while. So uh, it was just great to, to see him, great to hear him talk. And um, you know, it's, it's exciting because Chip Kelly is such an addition, such an adult, such a, uh, such a brilliant guy. And he's going to bring a lot to the Ohio State offense in 2024. And I can't wait to see it. Totally agree. Uh, thank you for all of you in the chat. I see Doreen is in the building. I see my boy Sean Schrock is in the building. My dude, uh, John Roby, uh, New Albany. Oh, I love New Albany. Great place. Uh, a lot of friends there. Uh, appreciate all you guys in here. Yeah, Quinchon Judkins got the the Uno, uh, so he got the one. It was interesting. I I I would have been stunned if JJ Smith did not get four. That was the number he's had for a long time. He got four. Um, let me go through the roster real quick. So they um. They released the updated roster, which I know some of you uh, roster roster files uh, love to kind of see who's what. So Davison and, and Quinshawn Judkins got the Uno. You know, the, the one is the most coveted number on the team for skill guys. Caleb Downs got two, which is uh, something that we, we projected. Um, yeah, I don't know how you can take this kid and not give him the number that he wants. Uh, Court Williams, you know, he's on defense, also wears two. I don't know if he's going to play again. Um, again, he's had a lot of, uh, he had an ACL. I mean, he's out for all of spring. He's had a lot of injuries. Great kid. I mean, he's a captain like two years ago. Um, you know, he's a respected guy, but, you know, if your body gives out, your body gives out. So it kind of is what it is. Uh, Lincoln Keenholz went to three. Uh, Jihad Carter is also three. You know, you got to understand, these guys all want single digits, all of them. So, you know, the, 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 there's seldom a case where there's, uh, a single issue, single digit, because all these guys want single digits, especially the receivers, the high end skill guys. JJ Smith gets four, uh, which was you know, probably you know when you're the number one player in the country, it's easy to promise that guy you can give him whatever he wants, uh, give him the number he wants. Uh, you don't want to start off with a kid like JJ and give him anything other than the exact number he wants. And even if you got to get rid of somebody, you do it. Um, it kind of worked out swimmingly because Jolene Fleming transferred. It opened up four for JJ. Um, God bless Julian Fleming, but he's nowhere near what JJ is. Uh, Lorenzo Salas Jr. has had a fantastic offseason. Fantastic. Um, maybe, uh, not maybe, is one of the three to four fastest guys in the entire team. A guy that I think is going to get a look as a kick returner. He's a guy that, you know, I mean, he started against us, you know, when he played for Notre Dame and had that long catch early in the game. Um, and I just, you know, he's trying to figure out a role. I mean, he's, uh, he's got two years left of eligibility. Um, you know, and he's in the deepest cornerback room in Ohio state history. So it makes it, makes it hard. He's a guy that would, I think have a role on any other team, but he's got to figure out a role of being a backup. Cause I mean, when you've got Jermaine Matthews jr. As your Calvin Simpson, I mean, you got some major superstar power at that corner spot. Uh, Bryce West is out for spring. Uh, he's injured. Um, Sonny is obviously, uh, listed as a safety, um, but he's, you know, he's six, four, two forty, or he's not going to be, he's already a linebacker. He's a well linebacker. We said that last week on Buckeye scoop.com that he'd been moved to linebacker officially. Uh, the rest of the world caught up today when they actually had eyeballs in it, but we don't wait to, you know, go to practice to figure it out. We just talk to people and we get the inside scoop. Uh, Jordan Hancock, seven, uh, Kirion, 
It's good seeing Lathan back. Um, but yeah, Julian Sane, who is going to be a superstar, uh, has got Troy Smithle, number 10. I kind of like that. I think it's good. Uh, Brandon Innes is in 11. I would guess after Quinshawn leaves, he'll get the Uno. He'll get number one next year. Uh, that's the number that he covets. But uh, I think they had a tough decision with Quinshawn. They couldn't give him a double digit because he was four. And you know, they gave that to JJ, so they gave him the one. Nevada, um, I know that you know the people probably uh, don't understand how important the number thing is, but you can read a lot into the numbers. Like when they give guys coveted numbers or they let guys change their numbers, generally it means that they've had a great offseason, they're in a good standing, because that has to get stamped by Mickey Marotti, the position coach, and Ryan Day. It's not like you can just walk into the equipment room and say, hey, uh, I want to go from number you know, 47 to number 2. Uh, and then they just stamp it. Like you have to like earn, especially the, like the coveted single digits, like a one or a two. Um, but your thoughts on that? Cause again, I think it's uh, it's always interesting to see who gets what, because some of these guys, um, you know, when you see them moving into the single digits or, you know, when you figure out a way to appease Quinshawn Judkins, who you took in the transfer portal, who'd worn four his whole career. JJ obviously gets four. That was the number they promised JJ. And you move Quinshawn to one, uh, which is kind of an upgrade from four. Uh, but your thoughts on, on kind of the silliness of the number game and, and any of these numbers that jump out to you? Some of these guys have gotten significantly bigger. Yeah, well, first of all, I, I told you before about things to not pay attention to and not overreact to, like the first 15 minutes of practice on the first day of spring ball or something like that. Now, something you can read stuff into is who got which number. You, can do, you get a really good idea because, uh, as you said, Kirk, it's at a great point. They, this isn't like, you know, like uh, AYSO soccer where they're like, hey, who wants number four? You know, who's the smallest? Here you go. Here's the four. And, and you know, Kirk, you're, you're the biggest. So you get number 15. Um, that's not how it goes here. You know, this is really uh, uh, it, they're very strategic. There's a lot of, uh, you know, I, I say ego, but I say that in the nicest sense of the world, because these guys all have big egos. These guys all you know want what they want. You know, they want to feel the love. They want to feel the respect. Um, of getting the numbers, and um, when you see certain you know kids kind of move up there and and, and get the, these the single digit numbers, you know they're held in high esteem. You know that they're cared about by Ohio State, and uh, you know that Ohio State's got got plans for them because they don't just do that um, you know out of the blue. I it, you I think you were talking about it. I can't remember whether it was Trussell or it might have been Meyer. Like if he was if he was punishing you, he'd give you like a bad number in practice or something like that, that like to wear or something like that, Kurt. Would you absolutely. Tell us where, no, where absolutely. No, like I mean, if if you're like a, a cornerback and you're number twenty or you're in a single digit and you do something stupid, say you fail a drug test, say you um you miss class or or you're late to a weight room, or if it's a, if it's a one time thing, if you've got a good history, they're not gonna dock you. But if you're consistently kind of an a hole. Urban would put like a cornerback in like number like 49 or something terrible. You know, cause those guys like, you know, they all want to look a certain way. They all want to look like they're the dude. So they want to be in one and they want to be in, you know, 21. They want to be in two. Uh, but you put them in like 49 and they're out there playing corner. Like it's, it's terrible. He did that too. Actually, Trestle did that to EJ Underwood. He took him out of two. Uh, he might have done that to Brandon. He took it out. He took Brandon Underwood out of or EJ Underwood out of two and put him in like forty nine or something because EJ 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 had so much talent. He was such an idiot. It was almost unbelievable how stupid he was um, and how much he screwed up. But it's just a, it's a good way to remind guys, that, hey, you're not that dude anymore, and you don't get to wear uh, the number that you want. But no, it's just uh, it's always interesting. And people always get a kick out of seeing where the freshmen are um, on the depth chart. Edric Houston was ninety six. He's one of those guys. He looks, he he looks a lot more athletic than Vernon Golson, but he's when you see him, he he elicits kind of that Vernon Golson reaction in terms of his physicality, because he is a monster, he is a beast. Um, you know, I just I don't know, like he's he's a guy that's got a massive upside. I also I did get a kick out of this today because I was looking to see if they updated the official rosters on our official school website, and they still have. Bill O'Brien, yeah, Bill O'Brien and Chip Kelly both both listed on OhioStateBuckeyes.com, which is hilarious to me. So I had to take a screenshot of that because way to go, guys. Uh, it's only been a month. Maybe you guys can update the uh, the actual rosters. But no, um, I think the story of the day is Devin Brown. 
Devin Brown had an excellent day. Seven on seven, he was excellent. And again, he's got a huge edge just because he knows the offense better than Will Howard. He knows the receivers better than Will Howard. Um, but I think he's got a chip on his shoulder. Like I think he has a chip that maybe Will Howard doesn't have. Now I'm sure Will's got massive ambition, and obviously I still think that you know Ryan Day went out and got Will Howard for a reason. But I think that you know these guys will push each other, and I think that the the benefit uh, to us as people that support Ohio State football is that look, you know, if I got some star that they're bringing in who's older than me and he's got more success than me and he's got more stuff like I and and I want that job like I'm gonna do everything to the nth degree as letter perfect as possible I'm never gonna leave the facility I'm not gonna go out I'm gonna eat nothing but you know you know, uh, vegetables and grilled chicken like I'm gonna try to do everything right because I mean it's a real competition you know Will Howard is I think he's an exceptional quarterback but you know Devin is gonna he's not gonna give that job up you know they know that if you're and I say this all the time, if you end up being the starting quarterback at Ohio State and you're good, not Kyle McCord, if you're actually good, then it's a it's a catapult into the NFL uh, in, in a top, you know, a first roundish type spot. And that's why Will Howard's here is he wants to go in the first round. And again, you know, you people laugh. They could say that, that sounds stupid. There's no way. But you look at the NFL draft now. I mean, J.J. McCarthy is being is being mocked as a top five pick, which is insane to me. Uh, and then you're now, now these GMs and I, I saw it today. Uh, I think it was Tannenbaum, the old Jets GM was talking about how, well, imagine if JJ McCarthy played at LSU and he had Malik neighbors and he had all those great wide receivers. Imagine if he played at Ohio state and he had uh, Marvin Harrison and Emeka Buka and uh, Carnell Tate. Like he didn't have that at Michigan. He was in a big run heavy offense. So imagine, so this is like the, kind of the mental aerobics or uh, the mental acrobatic stuff that these guys do, these GMs and these guys say, well, imagine if he had all these good players around him instead of being in Michigan's offense where they hand the ball off all the time. So um, could Will Howard turn into that? I think so. I mean, I don't think J.J. McCarthy is anything special, but he's, people are talking about him being top 10 pick already. And maybe I'm wrong. Nevada, I mean, am I wrong on J.J. McCarthy? Because if I'm wrong, tell me, please. Well, it's funny because – you know, that was when Harbaugh went to the the, the uh, Chargers. That was one of the things that he was saying right off the bat. And I was just thinking to myself, you know, Jim, you're, you're showing everybody how crazy you are right off, you know, right off jump street. You might want to stay on something, you know, a little less stupid. And um, maybe he's not crazy. Maybe, I don't know. This just feels like the, the classic emperor has, you know, has no clothes type of situation where I feel like I'm the only sane person here looking at this kind of going, the guy can't pass the football. He can't pass the football accurately. He pressure when he's under pressure, he completely falls apart. He's not a good quarterback. Um, but you know, I don't, I don't know. Maybe he's the greatest thing ever. And I, I just don't understand. We're, we're going to find out though. I guarantee you one thing we'll, we'll review this point once again on this podcast at some point in the future. I, I guarantee we will not forget discussing JJ McCarthy. I uh, yeah, I, um, yeah, I, I, I just, I, it's like one of those ones where it just, it, it'll never make sense to me. And then, you know, you'll look back in a few years and teams will be moving on from them. Um, I don't know. It's kind of like Baker. Like, I mean, your, your boy Baker, Baker Mayfield is going to hit free agency right now. And I mean, he's been let go by four teams already. I mean, the Browns gave up on him. The Carolina Panthers gave him up for nothing. The Rams gave up on him. The Buccaneers gave up on him. And it's just like, you know, that's why you don't draft like, you know, little tiny quarterbacks that are slow and fat and stupid and drunk and tackled by cops and whatever. It's, I don't know. Maybe that's just me. Uh, we got some super chats. We're to get through these. Oh, uh, appreciate oh, hold on, you guys. Hold on. You, need, you, you need to put that on a t-shirt. You need to put that exact what? quote. Don't, D don't draft. It's, it's, slow, no, it's, fat, it, it's, it's stupid, too, it's too uh, long, but I, I could go after like, okay. just, just okay. slow, slow, fat and douchebag. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I need to write. Yeah, I mean, I mean, dude, he got cut by the Carolina Panthers for God's sakes, like the worst team in football. Uh, they gave him, you know, he went to the Rams for no, he literally got cut by them, like not even like a trade, like got cut. So and now he's now and the Buccaneers have him, and he actually had a good year this year, and they didn't franchise him. They just said, hey, you can walk, have a nice life. JR's rankings, thank you for the five. Hey guys, love the show. Appreciate you, my man. Excuse me. Any thoughts on Andy Staples saying Utah could end up in the Big Ten? Ooh. I don't know if that's a fit, Nevada. Um, maybe. I don't. I mean, eh. I mean, Utah, I'm not I'm not really dying for that one. I haven't heard you say that one of the Oracle. But, 
you know, I just, I think they would love to be in the Big Ten, but I don't know if the Big Ten would love them because not a big market. Um, Kyle Whittingham is one of the top five to ten coaches in football, in my opinion, uh, in, in college. Um, they're tough. I love everything about their program. I wish they were in a nicer climate. But I guess if you like to go skiing, if it's a late, you know, if it's a November game, you might be able to go to Park City. But uh, your thoughts, Nevada? Utah? Well, look, you know, we've talked about this before. Not everybody that's going to come in from here on out is going to be Notre Dame. Not everybody that's going to come in, you know, you, you've grabbed the plum. There's really only a couple of, you know, premier, you know, maybe three or four premier franchises left out there in, in college football. And after that, you're going to be filling. And so does Utah fill that? Doesn't excite me. Would, would I would I want to bring them in on the same terms that I did USC um, or UCLA or uh, Notre Dame or uh, North Carolina? No. But would I bring them in as a partial fund member um, and have them kind of earn their way into the conference? I mean, that, would, that wouldn't offend me. Um, but... Again, I'd really like to hear from the Oracle on this. He's got a much better handle on who the you know, realistic targets are. But again, when you start playing the game of 24 Big Ten, 24 SEC, and you just start filling out your little brackets, you run out of teams. <laughs> At some point, you got to fill them in with some names. And uh, I mean, not the craziest thing I've ever heard, but uh, uh, I'd have to really sit down with a pen and paper and see if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I just... Uh, we haven't heard that one. And again, this is not our discipline. I mean, the Oracle, and if, for those of you guys that are not on BlackSkip.com, the Oracle is a guy that we hired. Uh, he's an insider. He's very, very high level in, in the college football world. And he brings some awesome information. I mean, he's broken some big time stuff. Um, and, and a lot of it is stuff that you wouldn't get on any other Ohio State say because it's, this is, it's high level kind of college football, political moves, uh, expansion stuff uh coaching stuff um, he's been great with the michigan stuff knows a lot of people in the agent world um so he he's been awesome and again like we keep him secret because we don't want to lose his job and his access but he is he's a beast and he's a guy that he's a hilarious dude he's definitely not me or nevada because he thinks that nicole auerbach is attractive and That's i would true. rather i'd rather be back in delaware county jail than be with nicole auerbach for any length of time so and again i've seen both and i ain't trying to do that kind of thing so <laughs> there's why there's why i was like so that is not that that is too far off the reservation for us to even uh have a facade but it's just like holy cow i just like that almost cost him his job but his information has been so good that we're going to keep him but we, we had to at least get a, a mental, like a mental wear, welfare check on him when he said that Nicole Auerbach was attractive and he was sad that she's engaged now. Uh, D Sunny, thank you for the five. Appreciate your brother for being on here. As always, you're one of the best ones we've ever had. Who was the least imposing player that you ever saw and you couldn't believe that he was a beast on the field? God, man, you get, you ask the best questions because that is a great question. Let me answer that one. Let me answer. Let me answer that one. There's only one answer to this one. We'll see. Are you going to say Baker Mayfield again? No, because he's fat and slow and got tackled by a cop. I'm talking about not imposing, but a, a beast on the field. Dane Sonsenbacher, one of my favorite players at Ohio State. Yeah, I mean, but receivers can look like, I mean, he looks like a golfer. Dane, no, Dane is awesome. That was a, that was a classic picture of him walking in to like check in when the check in things he's wearing like these little little sandals and his little shorts and he looks like this yeah. this like like the little pool boy he looks like uh, huh. Chris Elliott in Cabin Boy and yeah. uh, he goes out there I mean and Dane was a baller you know that Dane Dane could play man that guy could uh, he was fearless okay. and he caught the ball Dane was a monster Dane is one of the best he was a captain I was lucky that he was a freshman. He actually scored a touchdown our first game. The first game of my senior year against Youngstown State. He, it was funny. Him and Torian Washington both scored touchdowns. Torian Washington was a really nice kid. He never scored another touchdown for the rest of his career. I'm like 99% on that. He scored a touchdown the first game of his freshman year and never scored again. Which I don't know if that's ever been done in Ohio State history. So there's a little trivia question. And if I'm wrong, I might be wrong. But I swear to God someone told me that because, you know, when – when a true freshman scores in a game, you know, you take note of it. Now it could be garbage time. It could be whatever, but it's still a touchdown in the, in the horseshoe as an 18 year old, which is cool. Um, but Dane, yeah, Dane was a monster. 
I mean, I want to say like, you know, I mean, like, like, I mean, David Patterson, um, because David was a guy that was a shorter guy, narrow guy, wasn't like humongous, definitely didn't have like the most ripped up body. I mean, we used to call him bad body, but on the field, he was a monster. Oh my God. He would embarrass guys. And he's a guy that was a great college player and it didn't translate to the NFL. He got hurt with the Falcons. He's a little undersized, didn't get drafted. Got, I think he got hurt at the senior bowl. He had a broke his foot. I mean, just, he, he has a rash of just bad luck, but he was a captain his senior year. Um, in high school, he was that, he was that dude. Like he was on my all-star team in the North South game in the big 33 and nobody could block him. I mean, he was that dude and he was, he was a beast. Like I love Dave. He's probably, probably one of my two or three best friends for my career there, but he just didn't look like much, but he was a monster now. And I'm telling you, like when you get in certain situations, like one-on-one pass rush, he would hit guys with the dirtiest spin move, the dirtiest bull rush. I mean, he made Rob Sims just look stupid one time. And Rob played in the league for like nine years. He hit him with a spin move and Rob, it was like his jock was down on the floor. And I remember this cause we were watching film and like, you know, we'd, we'd watch our reps and like, you know, when you have a, like a rat, a rep where you just look terrible, it's like the worst thing in the world. And you could like kind of count backwards until it's like your turn to be up. And they put the little clicker on and, you know, bowls is back there and his thing reclined and he's got the thing. And, and, and Rob, he has Rob the spin move, man. And Rob's like, coach, like, what am I supposed to do? And bowls is like, I don't know. Cause it was that clean. It was just like, what is like DeMarcus Ware? And I was like, but it was, it was just fun. Cause like David was, he was really good. And I think he's one of the more underrated teammates that I've ever had, but he is a beast. But D Sunny, dude, you bring the heat, man. I really appreciate you because some of these questions you ask, and I, it's always you. And you bring some, you spring fire, and I appreciate that. Uh, thanks for the deuce, uh, Ted Nehas. Appreciate you, brother. Did you see Sunny at Sam or DB taking it reps today? Um, well, he uh, he's playing well. They're trying to keep him at well. Um, I am not sure, you know, I'm just being honest, like from the people I talked to, I didn't get like a look on if they're doing the three linebackers. I would highly doubt they're doing a lot of three linebacker stuff because early on, especially when it's no pads, the running game is basically pointless because you can't really run the ball. I mean, you could do some stuff, but you know, when you're not in pads, you're throwing it 90% of the time because like you can't get double teams because you're not in pads. Like you're just, you can kind of fit into it, but there's always like this balance uh, that you have to strike when you're the offensive line, the defensive line, you're literally in no pads. So you can't really double team guys legally because you know, they have these acclimation days. It's like three days where you're not allowed to wear pads per the NCAA. So uh, you got to like do three non padded practices before you can do the pads. So Ryan day and urban Meyer like to knock those out before spring uh, break so after spring break, it's on. Like you're putting the pads on, you're getting strapped up, and it's like real football. But right now, you know, again, it's more um, seeing what, how much guys know the plays, how fast they can go, can they throw it and catch it. Um, you know, it's a lot of assignment check, but you, you know, you can get something out of this. But again, like it's it's the old uh, you know, the cliche bingo where you say, oh well, you know, they're just out there in their underwear running around, and you can't really tell what you can tell, but you can tell something. I mean, I'm telling you, like when I was out there and and I, I didn't have pads on. I still treated it like I was in pads because I mean, you're, you know, you never know when a guy's going to try too hard or try to bull rush you or try to do something stupid with no pads. And so you got to like stay on guard. But, um, I, I don't think that they were in anything where they'd want Sonny out there at Sam, uh, this early. Now, now I'm saying he, it'll be interesting to see if they do get heavier sets, if they put Sonny out there at Sam. Uh, but I think they're really trying to get him to learn will. Um, and it's going to be him versus CJ. And I was told from a great source that him and CJ, that's going to be the biggest battle of spring. And we had that on Buckeye Scoop last week. Uh, those two are head up. You know, CJ is obviously getting the first nod. Sonny's learning it, though. And Sonny is not going to be sitting on the bench for very long. So I would project Sonny to beat out CJ just because he played more than CJ last year. He's more veteran, even though he's technically a birth year younger than CJ. He was more the guy the coaches trusted more, even though he's playing back at safety last year. Um, Nevada, your thoughts on Sonny? Because I could see some packages where you put him out at Sammy, put CJ at Will versus heavier teams, teams that run multiple, you know, the two tight end stuff, because that's a good way to match up is put Sonny out there. Uh, but your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think that is something that we'll see um, 
but no, I, I, I did not hear that was any, that that was a day one install or that they had anything to do with that today. Um, but to be honest with you, I didn't ask either. I didn't ask if they did any three linebacker stuff. But the Sonny CJ thing is going to be, I mean, it's kind of a battle of two guys, in my opinion, that both have this tremendous potential, both have this tremendous physicality, uh, both come with these high accolades, but both neither one of them's done <laughs> done much. So uh, I'm just looking to see who flashes, who kind of comes up, who steps up, and really starts making the plays because uh, it's 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 now or never. It, you know, these, it's got time for those guys to come up, make the plays, do the things, um, or or they're going to get left behind. And you know, it's interesting. You know what they're doing with Arbol Reese and. You know, he's a big kid and you know they like him out there or not didn't hear as much about Gabe Powers today but Gabe you know Gabe's a guy that I like a lot too and so I you know if Sonny or or CJ falter then expect those guys to see it because in, in a season like this you're gonna need a pair and a spare and then probably another guy on top of that because it's gonna be a brutal season it's gonna be just a war of attrition the entire year so everybody's gonna have to be ready and depth has never been more important than it is in 2024. So, um, you know, before we're like, hey, who's our starter? And ah, the heck with the backups. Man, you cannot say that this year because you're going to need the backups to play and play a lot and play well when they do. So uh, we need everybody to step up. And, and again, you look at the end of last season, like Tommy Eichenberg, who I love and is one of my favorite Buckeyes of all time. He's a warrior. Um, you know, he dislocated elbow, you know, and, and honestly, like I, it, it's like one of those ultimate, decisions it's like one of those self versus self decisions where you know do i go out there like a warrior like on my shield like these guys you're know, kind of predetermined they've watched 300 you know a few too many times like a lot of us did when we were younger or do you pull yourself out and let cody simon play against michigan i mean again when you're a captain and you're tommy eichenberg and you're wired that way there's no way in the universe he's not going to play in the michigan game but you know was it the best course of action given how bad his elbow was probably not but again, that's, you know, again, in, in this game, it's a physical game. The season's long. Gabe Power's got to play this year, and he got to play good. So, I mean, there ain't no, ain't no more waiting around. It's been three years. He's got to produce. Um, and James knows that. I mean, James, James, you know, you know it's kind of like heavy is the, head, is the head that wears the crown. James wanted this linebacker job, and he's got a room that is is talented but very inexperienced. And I think that having James lead that room – will be the best thing that ever could happen to that room. Because James is a guy, he was he was that room. Like in 06, we lost Anthony Schlegel, A.J. Hawk, Bobby Carpenter. Like Bobby and A.J. obviously first round picks. A.J. was the best player in the country that his senior year. Uh, went fifth overall in the draft to the Packers. Bobby went mid first round. Schlegs went in like the third round. Um, so that next year, the, all those guys that we had coming in 06, none of those guys had ever played. Like Marcus Freeman, uh, didn't play at all in 05. He had a, a medical issue where he redshirted in 05. You know, we had James who you know, played, uh, you know, like five plays against Notre Dame and like five plays against Michigan, you know, cause that was the big thing. It's like, you know, Bobby got his leg broken half against Michigan by Jake long. And they said, Oh, well the young Lauren, I out there. was like, James out there for like seven plays. Cause we played nickel the whole game once, once Bobby was out. Um, and again, that was kind of the plane anyways, because Michigan was a three receiver set team. So was Notre Dame. We played a lot of nickel versus Notre Dame. So James played. And again, I'm not downplaying the fact that James out there playing as a true freshman in the two biggest games of the season. James was a fantastic freshman and a kid that you know, obviously had you know, one of the greatest careers in school history. Um, but that 06 year, you know, we had no idea what we had in that linebacker room. I mean, because we had Marcus who didn't play in 05. Uh, Larry Grant showed up. And again, at this time, uh, in 06, like people thought, oh, Larry Grant's going to be the starter because he was uh, junior college All American, number one junior college player in the country. You know, looked the part, athletic dude. But you know, he got here and he stunk. Like, I mean, I mean, 06, he wasn't any good. I mean, he played a little bit, but he wasn't like you know, he he didn't walk on the field like he was Ray Lewis and take over the job. So we ended up rolling with uh, mostly James. And mostly Marcus, um, which was fine. You know, well, Curtis Terry and some other guys. You know, we had you know, we had some guys that were you know, good role players, um, not great NFL players, but guys that were good, good, solid college players. Um, so again, like you know, getting that experience level up, uh, you know, you got to get you know, you got to figure out a way to get these guys to play like veterans, even though they're not veterans. And I think James can do that, and that's why uh, I'm really excited about his hire. 
Uh, Sean, thank you for the 10. Appreciate you, my man. Uh, I will get, I get Will Howard has the trump card of being a proven commodity, but he's a flawed quarterback. Otherwise, he'd be in the draft. Uh, Brown will do enough in the offseason to force day to extend the QB comp into week one, in my opinion. Nevada, your thoughts on that? I mean, it's not crazy talk. You know, it's not, I like Devin Brown. I thought Devin Brown showed enough in practice last year that I thought he should have played more than he played. And should he have played a, in front of Kyle? Debatable, but certainly, you know, a point, but he sh certainly should have played more. So it wouldn't shock me at all with him, you know, with, you know, you know having years in the program, years in the offense, you know, being ahead of Will Howard, you know, for a while. And you know, could he ultimately beat him out? Yeah, again, not crazy talk at all. You know, I, I don't want to write him off, but, you know, if I'm betting, gun to my head, I'm betting on Will Howard because, you know, while he's flawed, you know, he, he's, he beat some really good teams with really bad talent. And, and it was just on him to do it and make plays and go out there and, um, you know, do things as kind of a one-man band. And he's not going to have to do that at Ohio State. So, you know, while he certainly has flaws, I think some of his flaws were accentuated by the fact that he was literally around, you know, I, I wouldn't even call it B minus talent, maybe C plus talent, because when's the last time Kansas State landed a top 250 player? Like never. So um, he's going out there with like little kids and having to play Texas and some of the big boys and keeping competitive games, beating some other teams, doing some other things. And, um, you know, I, I, like I said, I'm a big fan of Will Howard. I mean, would I love Devin Brown to do it just because it's a great story? Absolutely. So, you know, we'll let it play out in the field. But like I said, my money's on Will. But um, my heart is certainly rooting for Devin. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, I like them both. I, again, like, it made the best fan win. I think Will's going to be the starting quarterback. Again, Ryan Day. I just, I always follow the actions of the decision makers. You know, again, when I when I say stuff, it's not because I don't like kids. It's not because I um, have a vendetta. It's just because I, I, I can read the tea leaves better than basically anybody that's in this discipline of, of the media because – I've been a coach. I've sat in the staff room. I know coaches can tell the truth. They can lie. And a lot of coaches are somewhere in the middle. So again, with, with this, you know, Will Howard, um, Ryan recruited him. Ryan went and saw him in early December in, in Dallas on the, on the QT on the down low. Um, Will Howard was at the team hotel, uh, leading up to the Missouri game. You know, Devin's had his opportunities. He's been hurt a few times. I love Devin. I love Devin's mentality. I think he's tough. I think he's raised right. I was praying to God that he would have a monster cotton bowl uh, and have that big, you know, 350 yard, you know, four touchdown game. Uh, but it got hurt. And again, sometimes like you're a victim of, of circumstances you can't control. Again, Joe Burrow might have had a whole different livelihood if he would have not broken his wrist and he ended up being our starter here. Because I mean, I don't know if he would have turned into what he turned into at LSU, but who knows? So, I mean, sometimes, uh, things happen. And, and again, like, you know, this is uh this is going to be an open competition. And again, the thing I always tell people, I'm like, look, people always get anxiety and jittery, and nervous and scared and any other way you want to describe it about the fact that they're like, Oh my God, we don't have CJ Stroud. Oh my God. We don't have a quarterback. And I'm like, look, if we've got Ryan day, chip Kelly, and whoever's in that room, whoever walks out of there, like to take the first snap of the Akron game is going to be really good. And that's what I'm telling you. Like, I mean, I don't worry at all. If Ryan Day is our head coach and then he hires his mentor as our quarterback's coach and those two guys are sitting in that room coaching that quarterback, because again, Ryan Day is very hard on his quarterbacks. Very hard. And again, I'm here for it. I'm good with it. It doesn't have to be all, you know, warm glasses of tea and tiddlywinks every time you're coaching a quarterback. And Ryan is not that. He breathes fire on these quarterbacks. And again, he hardens them up. And all of a sudden, when they need him the most, they execute like CJ Stroud. Like CJ Stroud is going to probably be an NFL Hall of Famer because of the work that Ryan Day put into him, and he turned him into a monster. You know, and they get to Houston, and he's he's already pre-made into a great player, turned Nico Collins into like a freaking Hall of Famer in one year. So uh, again, I think that uh, let Ryan do his thing. Now that he's got his mentor in the room, I just I can't imagine a, a better thing in the universe for Ryan than having Chip Kelly in the building with him, his ultimate advocate. Um, again, I'm excited for it. And again, I think Will Howard is going to absolutely explode this year um, just because, you know, the way we run the quarterback, the way we get these nice, easy throws, these RPOs, um, it's built for him, you know? So again, I think whoever plays in this offense is going to be one of the top three 
Heisman finalists, in my opinion. ZZM, thank you for being a Scoop Ultra member. Thank you for the five free shoes, my man. Ooh, boy, here we go. Kendrick Houston wind up being one of the few freshmen that winds up getting playing time immediately, at least behind the starters. I hope he does. I pray to God that he does. Um, he looks like an animal, plays like an animal. He was the best defensive player in the country last year in high school. Um, I think it's going to make Kenyatta and Kane Curry you know, step up because those guys weren't good enough to play last year. I, I think Edric has to play as a freshman. I, just, I think that when you're losing Jack and JT for sure after this year, um, you got to play Edric and you got to play him a lot and he's going to learn on the fly and he's got to go, you know, you know, do the best that he can. It's hard to play as an 18 year old in the big 10, but he physically looks like a 22 year old. So again, I, I throw that 18 year old stuff out the door when you look like that kid. Um, your thoughts about it on Edric Houston. Yeah. I mean, you guys know he was my favorite player in the uh, incoming class, even more so than JJ Smith. That's not JJ Smith slander. It's just uh, Edric Houston love. Um, I, I love those disruptive defensive linemen that can play, on the inside, can play on the outside. You can play anywhere on the defensive line. Um, you know, I, I, you, you hate to make these. I'm, I'm not saying he's as good, but he, he reminded me in high school of like an Aaron Donald type of player. Um, he's got that kind of explosion, got that kind of build, and you see him today. And you see, you see him, his yoked up arms and everything. I mean, he's uh, he's coming in ready to go. So I would, I, I would be shocked if he was not in the two deep right off the bat. And uh, they, they got to get him some burn. Again, we've talked about it, the long season, the need for depth. But last year, the underutilization of the backups on the uh, on the defensive line was criminal. I think it cost us in two games. Uh, good news is I think Ohio State realizes that. They realize they, they got to play some more of those guys just out of bare necessity, if for no other reason. And uh, for, I, I think Edric Houston will definitely be one of those guys that's in the mix. And I think when he plays, he'll play well. Yeah, I think um, you, you got to get something out of these DNs. Again, I, I've said it. The most ridiculous thing I've ever seen in my life in the history of Ohio State football is the fact that Jack Sargent and JT Tubelo had to play an entire game at defensive end versus a really physical Notre Dame team, and they didn't have any confidence in, in Kenyatta or Caden to give those guys any relief. And again, you know, they, there's been times where people are like, well, Kenyatta, Jack, again, if you listen to the media, and again, the media, most of those people, they're journalists, which is a great profession that's dying very quickly, like they know absolutely nothing about football and they really don't know anything about like, like, like football in training camp and practices. I mean, it's, it's embarrassing. And so they say, Oh wow. Kenyatta Jackson ran past like miles Walker or some third string tackle. And man, he looks really good. And he's going to be great. And like when they put him in a real game, you know, they teams, teams run right at him, you know? So like teams, you know, he jumps out of his gap and, and you know, there's a reason why he doesn't play. And again, I think he's got a lot of talent, I think he, you know, he, this is a huge year for him, but you know, it's, it's go time for this kid. You know I mean? Especially with Edric Houston coming because there's going to have to be a decision. Maybe Edric Houston has to play this year. He can't not play. He's like JJ Smith, like JJ Smith. You can't play him behind Jaden Ballard or Kirion Graves or like JJ has got to play. He's got to be, you know, the, a top four wide receiver with Ennis Tate and Emeka Buka. Like Edric Houston is probably going to be a top four D end um, and again, he's got to work his way ahead of Caden Curry or Kenyatta Jackson. Like, I mean, those guys got to get a rotation going to the, because the season is long and our D our D D ends and our D line wore down as the season went on because we didn't rotate them at all. So, you know, by the time they get to the Michigan game, those guys could barely walk. They probably needed like rascal scooters to get on the field and take on double teams for Michigan, which is crazy. Cause again, these guys are on scholarship too, and they need to start earning it. I'm talking to some of these backups that don't play. And they wonder why they don't play is because as soon as they get in, uh, they get housed. So, again, Edric is a guy. Uh, they got to figure out a plan to get him on the field. If that means he has to live at the Woody Hayes, so be it. But um, he's too good. And, again, his talent is just uh, immense. And he needs to be a guy that needs – frankly, he needs to start as a true sophomore. I'm just going to put that out there right now. Uh, D. Sunny, thank you for the five. If a corner is good enough to shadow a number one receiver the entire game – would you do that, or it depends on the scheme? How often are corners that good? D. Sunny, again, you bring the best questions. You're absolutely fantastic. Um, you know, I I I think it depends on how much man you want to play. We play a ton of man with Jim Knowles, which is fine. Um, we played a we were a little bit less aggressive 
Um, I think, uh, I think that, you know, if you've got, there's just not many guys that are that dude that can just follow around a one, um, and take him out of the game. I mean, that's like Jalen Ramsey. That's like Revis Island when he was in his prime. Uh, there's not many guys that are like that. I mean, in terms of guys that we've had like that, um, you know, we had Jeff Okuda, uh, was probably close to that. Um, I don't know. I, I feel like. You know, it just depends on the the scheme and the coordinator. Like, are some guys better left and right? Are some guys better field and boundary? Like, with Trust and Mark D'Antoni, we played field and boundary. Field means that you got a corner out on the wide side of the field, the field, which is Chris Gamble, excuse me. And then you put Dustin Fox on the short side of the field where he'd be jumping slants and uh, out routes and that type of stuff. Um, you know, again, like with Gamble, that's a great example of a guy that could shadow because he shadowed Andre Johnson, who's a Hall of Famer. Um, but we just don't have many guys that are that, I think that guy, I mean, Denzel probably could be, but Davidson's good. Like when you, it, I think it depends on if there's, you know, it, it depends on the matchup to me, because if there's like Justin Jefferson on one side and then like Nevada buck is the number two receiver, like you probably want to put you know Denzel on Justin Jefferson and then you put whoever on Nevada. But if it's two good guys, then it's probably just wherever they line up. But that's a great question. I just think that it, uh, it depends on how good is the receiver, how good is their throw game, uh, and how good is the corner that you're gonna have shattering them. Because like you, know, you, if if the two corners are equal, equally average or equally great, like you don't really have to do that. But if you've got one corner who's just like outstanding, um, and again, that's why in the NFL, if you have a guy like Jalen Ramsey, he makes like thirty five million a year because he has to go play against Justin Jefferson every week, and he has to play Jamar Chase, and he has to play, um, you know, the guys that are the. The, the the superstars that could light up the stat sheet. So that's a great question. Nevada, uh, D Sunny asks if a corner is good enough to shadow a number one receiver the entire game, would you do that? Or it depends on the scheme and how often are corners that good? I and mean, that's a great question. Yeah. It's really hard to do. Like you said, you know, when you're playing zone to have, you know, like it's not like you can play one guy in man and then everybody else zones up and stuff like that. I mean, the Packers did a little bit with Jair Alexander where they had him, you know, chasing uh, Jefferson around the field and turning into, but like I said, unless you've got a guy like that, and Ohio State, it's also kind of an ego thing with the cornerbacks. Where the cornerbacks all feel like they're good enough to kind of man up and and you know handle those guys. Um, so yeah, if you're an exclusively a man team or primarily a man team, you know you you could do that. But like I said, when you get into zone, man, it's really hard because there's so many different ways. You know, the offenses can beat that. You know, put, put guys in motion. And you see if the guy's following them or if he's handing them off, they, then they know exactly what the coverage is. And so uh, you got to be really careful with that because if you do that, sometimes it can mess up the rest of your defense and they can exploit you the other way. So uh, it's a, it's a, it, it, it happens, but infrequently. And I, I don't remember, I can't remember it ever happening in Ohio. I'm not saying it hasn't happened, but I don't, if it did, I don't remember it. So I'm going to have to refresh my memory on that. In, in terms of what? The, the shadow thing? Uh, it, uh, yeah, like a guy shadowing the number one wide receiver for the opposing team. I don't remember ever seeing that. Well, I know we did it with Chris Gamble versus Andre Johnson in the Miami game. I know for a fact that he was he went everywhere Andre went because um, you couldn't put Dustin Fox on Andre Johnson unless you had a death wish. So like Gam Gamble covered Andre the whole game because um, that was like I mean he was that was as good of a performance as, as there's ever been because Andre was I mean he's a first ballot Hall of Famer and. You know, he's he's going into the Hall of Fame because he was that good. But in, in in like in my world, like I don't think Malcolm Malcolm didn't shadow. Um, so you know, if Malcolm didn't do it when I played, then no one's gonna do it because Malcolm was the best corner I ever played with by far. Uh, you know, because we had like Antonio Smith, and you know teams would wear out Antonio because they weren't trying to try Malcolm out at corner, um, which is fine. I mean, again, like if you got a first rounder and a guy that's a walk on and he's a, who's an undrafted guy, like, of course you're not going to go after the first rounder. Uh, that, uh, just when you bring up Chris Gamble, has anybody ever been more enigmatic than Chris? I mean, Chris, what a player, what, what a legend at Ohio state. And then he leaves the NFL and just kind of falls off the grid completely. Like, I don't know if anybody's even, or at least to my knowledge, you know, he's like, it's like, he's uh I, I don't even know where he is. Do you have any idea where he is, Kurt? You know what's funny is uh, somebody, um, somebody uh, from our site actually found him. He's down in Florida. Oh, oh wow. He, uh, he, um, 
he actually lives down the street from him. And again, Gamble's a guy that didn't come back to the O2, like the 20 year reunion where they're all on the field. He doesn't come back for anything. And, and again, like I like that. Like I like, I'm good with that. Like I mean, Chris Gamble, he's not at every gas station signing. He doesn't do the Buckeye cruise. He doesn't wear his Jersey around. Um, I, I love that actually like Chris Gamble, one of my favorite players of all time. He is, he was a great teammate. He didn't say, I don't know if he said seven words the entire season, probably the most quiet dude I've ever been around. And he was an absolute freak of nature monster. Um, but like Jim Trestle can't get a hold of him. Nobody can get a hold of this guy. Doss couldn't get a hold of him. So, you know, everyone's like, oh, you know, why does it, why isn't he at like uh former player day at the Woody? Or why does he go, why does he hang out around Columbus? Like, cause some guys aren't like that. Like Darian Scott, like I've seen Darian Scott like one time in 20 years, you know, like I, some of those guys that I played with that are awesome dudes, like that just ain't their thing. Like when, when the, when the books close, the books close, they're not trying to open it up every day and go kick it with a bunch of 18 year olds at the, at the Woody. Cause that's kind of douchey. Um, yeah. So, so Chris is just kind of in his own little world. And I, I, I respect that. He was first round pick, made a ton of money for the Panthers, retired quietly, lives quietly, doesn't do a podcast, doesn't do commercials. Like, you know, I, um, I love it. You know, again, gamble, Gamble, like if I had to make an all-time team, he, I, him, and I'd probably put him and and Tuan as my two corners, Antoine, because uh, those are two of my favorite players ever. And like Gamble was just, he was just a beast. And, and again, like that year, that magical season he had where he played both ways, like how can you not respect a guy that does that, especially when he's playing corner against Andre Johnson? Like that's insane. Um, what a player, and what, and again, a great teammate. But hey, you know that's the thing is like. The guys that I love the most when I played, I like see the least. They never come back. Like I miss Darian Scott and some of those guys. And you know, it just kind of is what it is. Uh, yeah, D Man was great. Um, Coconut Dreams one two three. Uh, thank you uh, for Big Scoop Ultra member as always, and thank you for the five. Speaking of T-shirts, Kirk and Nevada Mello and Torg put together a great slogan earlier for a T-shirt. Come for the gold pants. Stay for the natty. Well, I've got gold pants. I'd rather have the natty. Can I make that a t-shirt? The Kirk Barton t-shirt. I have six pairs of gold pants. I trade all those for a national championship. Um, but I, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I get it. I mean, we got to we gotta win a pair of gold pants first. It's been a hot minute since we did that. But I like that. You know, I think that the natty is, uh, that's the goal this year. I mean, it's the only goal, really. I mean, if you, if you don't win the natty, as much as it's great to beat Michigan, beating Michigan is awesome. What do you think the Natty's the ultimate? Like those teams never die. Um, what do you think, Nevada? Uh uh Mello and Torg put together a slogan today. Come for the gold pants to stay for the Natty. I mean, I, I get it, but we gotta, you know, we gotta beat Michigan first before we do anything. Your thoughts. Yeah, I was gonna say I would trade Kirk Barton's six pair of gold pants for a three liter bottle of Ace of Spades. Oh God! In a heartbeat? Are you kidding me? That's yeah, like, that's like, yeah, that's like seventy thousand dollars. Oh my God! No, I think it's I actually think it's only twenty five grand. Only twenty five. So twenty five grand for these six pairs of uh, things. What do you think? So here's the thing, because this is going to be this will this will get misconstrued on this. Kirk Barton <laughs> wants to sell his gold pants. For, like, like, <laughs> like, like you got to understand, like the, the gold pants for one. You can get them remade if you need to. If you lose them, legit. Now you can't go get them remade every week because I know the the guy or you know, Chris Carrier that makes is a good friend of mine. I I don't need to get mine remade. I don't sell my gold pants. I don't sell any of my stuff. I never will. But like they're not really that valuable because they're not real gold. They're like spray painted tin. So like if someone wants to offer me twenty five thousand dollars for gold pants that cost <laughs> like a hundred dollars to get remade, like. I'm a capitalist, guys. I'm sorry. I mean, I hate to break it to you, but it's like, you know, well, your kids will want your gold pants. I'm like, well, they can go get their own gold pants. They go earn their own stuff. It's like, I mean, but like, again, they're just, you know, they're to me, like, they're cute and they're great, but like, it's like spray painted tin. And I mean, it's, it's great. It's an honor to have them. I don't even have any of them because I gave them to my mom and sister. So they have all my pairs of gold pants. Like they wear them on a little necklace. Like, I don't wear my gold pants because I'm an actual man. Like, I don't have to have a necklace with my gold pants on like some guys do. I'm like, are you guys serious right now wearing, like, a charm bracelet around your neck? But that's just me, <laughs> and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe Kirk's a big meanie. He's dumb. He's a bully. Whatever you want to call me. But, like, I'm not going to walk around with my gold pants around my neck. 
You guys can go check the resume. I don't need to like remind people with my stupid gold pants on. But again, I did love winning them, but I liked giving them to my mom on Mother's Day because then I did not have to buy her a gift. I could just give her gold pants. Mm-hmm. So that was a, that was the greatest part about being in Michigan. I'd have to buy Bridget anything. That was good. So, but if that, if that ace of spades, if you can negotiate that ace of spades, deal, let's rock. Let's roll. <laughs> we're coming. We're, we're, we're coming, baby. We're, we're, coming we're coming strong, coming, baby. Let's we're coming strong. Nevada's got the gratuity, though, because that's going to be 20% honor, Grant. It's going to be $8,000 in gratuity. Um, <laughs> Donald and Karen uh, Rossbeck, um, uh, five, thank you for being scuba officer. Thanks for the five. Who was the hardest person you went up against to block? Uh, Nevada, OH. I O. God, I was going to say my ex wife on Instagram, but that was an easy oh, one. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, zinger. Zinger. Um, <laughs> I always say that because Kim's watching and she's laughing right now. Um, anyways, yes. no, I, 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 I'd say Will Smith or Mario Williams. Mario Williams was different because, you know, he went first overall in the draft. He's probably, you know, among the greatest athletes to ever play football. He was 6'7, 290, and he ran a 4'440. Like I've never seen anything in the universe like Mario Williams. And again, he he had a nice NFL career, made multiple Pro Bowls, whatever. Um, and, and a lot of it was just because he was just so talented. It wasn't because he was some dynamic worker or some whatever, but he's just so physically gifted, it was crazy. If he actually put in the work and wasn't a lazy turd. Probably been the best defensive end ever play, um, you know. But I, uh, I don't know. Like I, uh, to me, I, I, uh, I just love um, thinking like Will Smith was the guy because Will Smith made me into the player I became, like by far. Like going against Will Smith as a freshman every day, it was like the killing fields for me. I mean, he used to just absolutely destroy me. But it was good because again, you get you know, it's, it's kind of like you get killed a little bit slower and slower and slower each time and. He coached me up a lot. And, you know, and the reason I was going against Will is because I was on scout team and he was a starter. And, you know, when you're a freshman, you're a scout team guy. Um, but, you know, for me, uh, like I owe my career to Will Smith because I had to go against him every day as a freshman. So, like, when, I, when it came time to, like, block regular guys, like when I was competing for the job the next year, it was like a cakewalk. I mean, Will was in the first round, went to the Saints. He was gone. Thank God. Didn't have to go against him anymore. Um and and but he was so fast and he was so good so mean and i love that dude like i mean i miss him he's like the guy i probably miss the most probably my favorite player just because he's you know he was just a bad bad mofo a bad dude um so i'll say will just because i went against him every day and mario only played once in 04 didn't give him any sacks against him but he was he was he was really you know a long arm guy six seven and he's got the longest reach ever one against i think but he was also fast so he kind of had everything but he didn't have like a great um, array of moves like he was mostly a bull rush guy and a speed guy um but yeah uh probably mario um c brown thank you for the five appreciate you wanted to pet you boys on the back these other podcasts out here reporting sunny's a full-time linebacker like they're the first to know love the scoop nevada oh i o. yeah i mean like we had that literally last week on this show. Like there's a lot of, cause again, it's easy to like, there's rumors and innuendo and projections, but we literally reported it. It's like, Hey, he's with the linebackers now. So then everybody shows up today and you know, they're, you know, finishing up at waffle house. They walk into practice. Oh, so he's with the linebackers. Like, yeah, we had that last week. We, that's why we're the scoop. We had that a nugget. Um, but yeah, like, I mean, I, I, I think that that battle with him and CJ is going to be one for the ages. I, I like Sonny in it. I mean, Sonny played more last year. I think he's he's a specimen, but they're both beasts. You know, again, like those are two guys that are the future of the linebacker room uh, in a major way. I think obviously, um, you know, with Cody being what he is, you know, it wouldn't be hard to project that those two guys are the starting Mike and Will next year, Sonny and, and CJ in some order. I don't know if you'd want to put who you want to put where, but I think it uh, it'll be really interesting to see what those guys do. Uh, Nevada, uh, your thoughts. Again, we put that in a nugget last week about Sonny moving and competing against CJ. Nose to nose. I mean, they did it all winter. I mean, those guys were going head to head in drills all winter because, again, you have to understand when they do a position battle, if it's the two starting quarterbacks are Kirk Barton versus Nevada Buck, like the coaching staff, a.k.a. Mickey Murati and uh, Kenny Parker, the strength coach, Schlegel, Ryan Day, you know, Chip Kelly, you know, whoever, whoever's judging it all they track everything 
you know, every rep you do, uh, as much as they can put you against each other, they're going to do it. If, if it's like, okay, we're going to run 40 yard dashes. All right. Uh, Kirk and Nevada, you guys run against each other. Okay. Nevada won the same. Okay. Kirk won this time. And then, so when there's any consternation or any anger or, Hey, you know, why did Nevada buck beat me out as a starting quarterback? Well, he beat you in 85% of the competitive snaps that you guys went against each other. He graded out higher than you in all the practices. He had two of the three scrimmages he graded out higher. Like they love to have data to support their decisions. So again, they've been putting Sonny and CJ against each other all winter because again, then, you know, if, if one wins out and one's the backup say, well, he was better. He was better. And they'll do the same thing in the summer. Cause that's what they do. And again, you know, this is, this is big time football. I mean, you know, parents are going to show up and be upset. And why is my boy, why did he get beat out? And you know, it's good. Like urban Meyer was great. He'd have a stack, a folder this thick, on every kid and it's and if you know you know and my dad passed away a long time ago but it's like my dad shows up and says why is my boy why is my boy kirk not playing tackle why why did he get beat out by tim schaefer like trust could like put up the here's a folder well he was hurt for all of spring and he had shoulder surgery and you know he missed a workout whatever like whatever the thing is and 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 you know you need that ammunition because again it's big time ball and there's big money involved these kids all want to go to the nfl uh, you deal with dads and moms that frankly think that they're agents. Like they've watched any given Sunday and Jerry Maguire one too many times. And uh, so you got to have like a stack of stuff ready to go. Cause again, like it's not just, you know, it, it's not like the, the coaches have an agenda. The coaches want to play the best players they can because they want to prolong their careers and feed their families. So they're not, you know, I've, I've never been in a room where it was like, why are we playing that guy? He's terrible. And we should be playing this guy. I mean, the coaches are trying to play the best combination they can. Cause again, it's, it's either win or, or turn in your, your, your clipboard and your visor and your whistle and go to Akron or wherever uh, at Ohio state. Philip be lucky. My man, I appreciate you brother. Thank you for the 10. Are you as a friend? Oh, and by the way, your son has to call me. I called him and left him a voicemail. Uh, so I'm getting into the like uh, stalker territory because you know I got to sign him up. I'm signing up Philip's uh, son for pay it forward. Appreciate his service. So make sure he gives me a ring so I can get that set up for him. Um, as you are, uh, are you as afraid as I am? Devin Brown just unable to stay healthy. Unfortunately, uh, tough can't uh, do a broken thumb and high ankle sprains. You know I just think that sometimes you're a little snake bit, but I think Devin, um, you know I think he's doing everything he can to stay healthy. Again, I think that I've. I've played through a lot of injuries. I had injuries that kept me out of football. Frankly, in my career, like in the league, I had terrible injuries. Um, kind of just, you know, that was kind of like the train that fell off the tracks by the end of my career. Uh, I think Devin, um, it really comes down to health because he's had opportunities and he hasn't been able to stay healthy. So I think it's going to be real interesting to see um, how this com this competition stays up. But, you know, the thing is, is, you know, in general, in practice, you're not going to get hurt, you know, if you're a quarterback because you don't get hit. Um, so he's not getting his ankle rolled or tweaked or whatever. And you know, we saw kind of what happened with McCord's ankle last year. We saw Devin in the bowl game, get his ankle sprained. Uh, that won't happen in practice, you know, unless he, you know, steps in a pothole or something. So uh, I think we'll be in good shape there. Nevada. Uh, are you afraid or nervous about Devin Brown? Uh, just being unable to stay healthy. Um, again, I, I think he's a, he's a really tough kid. I think it killed him that he couldn't play in that, uh, that cotton bowl. But what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit of a concern, but, you know, they were both you know, kind of unrelated, weird kind of injuries when you go back and watch them on the tape. And, you know, they're trying to tape his ankles a little differently this year. Hopefully that prevents some of that stuff for not only him, but for some of the other quarterbacks. But is it a concern? Sure. Um, am I worried about it? No. Just because it, it sometimes just weird stuff happens, and it's happened to him a couple of times last year. Let's hope it doesn't happen a third, and um, I, I don't I don't think it will. I don't think it should be much of a concern going forward. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think that yeah, sometimes you're just snake bit, but you know he uh, again he's got to get rocking and, and stay healthy to stay in this competition. Uh, Gio did it. Uh, Forty two. Thanks for the ten. Appreciate you, my man. Join saying as big shoes to fall wearing number ten at QB. Go box. I don't like that they give out ten, um, but that's just me. I know that you're not you can't retire jersey numbers anymore, but. You know, I think that, you know, if it's retired, it's retired, but they still hand it out. Um, yeah, I mean, again, Troy was, you know, by definition, the best quarterback in school history. Obviously, people say CJ, Justin, whatever. But, you know, I mean, CJ never beat Michigan. And again, I see joint two overall in the draft and whatever and let down by defense. But, 
you know, Troy put the team on his back against Michigan and figured out a way to get it done. Uh, so Troy's my guy forever. Uh, Heisman Trophy winner. Big golf outing coming out uh, at Little Turtle uh, in August. If you guys want to go to that, look up uh, the Troy Smith golf outing. I will be there. Uh, it looks like it'll be a blast. So, um, but yeah, I, I just think that, you know, I think Julian, but I think Julian State's got something to him, man. I'm really excited to see what this guy can do. So, uh, but your thoughts, Nevada, uh, Julian State in the Troy Smith jersey. I mean, it'll be great. You know, I mean, it's it, yeah. it, it, we talked about the jerseys and I mean, give, when you give them 10, you know, a lot of expectations come along with that. You know, that's a, that's a pre premier quarterback number. Uh, they obviously like him a lot, giving it to him and, uh, Nobody wore it better than Troy, though. That's for sure. And, yeah. you know, I mean, uh, amazing player, amazing Buckeye. Really you know, kind of wrong time to be in the NFL because a guy with his skill set now would be coveted in the NFL. But back then, a little bit of a fish out of water. So, uh, you know, it's uh, – but it doesn't, you know, diminish how great he was in college because he was a, a force of nature. Yeah, he was a monster. Uh, Randy's Beard, thanks for being a scoop. I'll remember, thank you for the five – why do other programs, Bama, Georgia, et cetera, rotate their freshmen, but Ohio State is the same tier of program and rarely does that? I have no idea, and it drives me absolutely insane, and I'm glad that you pointed that out, but um, it, it, it's something that I don't know what Ryan's mentality is on. Well, I, 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 I think it has to do with, you know, these guys have this obsession with padding their stats, and again, it kills us because we don't play young guys. We don't rotate the uh, – the two's in early enough. Like, we'll be up by 40 points and we'll have the starters in, throwing at the end zone, trying to get guys touchdowns, trying to get guys stats. And again, stats don't matter. You know, if we're first in the country in offense or third or eighth, like, it doesn't matter. I think it's, it's more important to get those young guys on the field and let those guys play a little bit, especially freshmen. You know, freshmen, um, especially the high-level freshmen, especially the the big-time, the Edric Houston's, J.J. Smith's, those guys have got to be active because – those guys are still getting recruited by other schools right now. So if you don't want to play those guys, these other schools are offering these guys money to boogie on out of here. Um, Cause that's, that's just how it's going to be from, from here on out. So you better make sure they're a big part of the program, make sure they're playing. Don't just have them sitting on the sideline, getting dusty. Um, that's my opinion. And I think that, uh, you know, getting those freshmen in there, it just amplifies recruiting. Uh, Cause you know, the mid tier guys are going to end up either, developing or transferring out anyways, but the high tier guys, you got to get them out there playing uh, just to be able to point to, Hey, we like to play freshmen and, you know, don't make us be there. Don't, you know, you're the reason why you don't play. It's not because of the coaches. The coaches want to play everybody, but a lot of these players, they either don't develop or they can't develop or whatever reason they're not good enough. But if you had, you know, 10 defensive linemen that were good enough to play at the level that Jack Story and JT play, they'd play them all, but Caden Curry and Kenyon aren't there yet. So, and they got to figure that out in a hurry. Because, again, I got high hopes for Caden Curry, especially. That kid's got a lot of juice, good pass rusher. Um, they got to figure out a way for him to, to get out there and produce. And they got to figure out for the how for, for those guys to play early downs versus the run. I think that's the key for Kenyatta and Caden is they got to take the running game as serious as they take the passing game. Because the ends always want to – they want to play the pass because they want to go get sacks. Because if you get 10 sacks, you'll be an All-American, you'll be a first-round pick. But you got to figure out a way to mentally be just as excited to play the run – which most of these guys aren't, uh, just being frank. Uh, Nevada, your thoughts. Why do other programs, Bama, Georgia, et cetera, rotate their freshmen, but Ohio State is the same tier program and really does that? Yeah, that's, you know, again, it's one of my areas of uh, concern with Ryan Day. Um, I, I'd like to think it's because he was doing so much. He was calling the plays, being the head coach, doing it all, and maybe he lost track. I don't know if that's a good excuse or not, but – um, I know it's been a point of emphasis with him this year during the off season when they had their kind of exit interviews with the players that he vowed that he was going to change that this year and it was going to be different. So we'll see. I'll take him at his word. Um, but he's telling everybody he's going to play more guys and play them more liberally. And uh, I hope he does. I think it'd be a huge benefit to the team if he followed through on what he says. But I believe he will. Yeah, I, uh, I totally, totally agree. Uh, Tora, what's up, baby? Uh, Akeem, the dream. I appreciate you, my man. Uh, thank you for the 20. Thank you for being a Scoop Ultra member. Thank you for being a wrench brother. Um, I got to get your address because I sent you guys, you guys, hats that I got you guys. Um, they're super dope. Uh, Kirk State, Golden State strapped up. Love to my brother, Nevada Buck. Really want to give a very special shout, shout out to my family in the chat. I do not have enough space to say what this 
community means to me. Dude, I appreciate you so much, my man. You are a gift from God because you are absolutely hilarious. And our group chat between me, you, and Devin is always uh, a highlight of my day reading it because you guys are funny. And Devin is very jacked up about the season. Uh, at this rate, pretty soon, within about five years, I think Devin's actually going to buy Ohio Stadium and just name it Devin Stadium or Scoop Stadium. And I'm super excited about that. But I appreciate both you guys. You guys are the best. Uh, Quinn Tucky, thank you for the 20. Chip Kelly press conference was impressive. The Al Hag reference put the beat on notice that they are no match for the intelligence level upgrade. Tim May's hee-haw approach is benefiting of a Texas Tech fan base. Ooh, you got the gloves out early on old Timmy. Um, Chip Kelly is a very impressive guy. He is one of my favorite guys I've ever been around. And again, I was lucky I spent a few hours around him. Um, had a couple cocktails with him at the Four Seasons uh, before the national championship game in Oregon. Just happened to luckily be staying there by the grace of you know, God. Actually, you know, I wasn't staying there. My friends were staying there, so I met them there. I was staying at the uh, the Hilton Anatole. That's where the team was at. But my friends were staying at the Four Seasons, and Chip Kelly was in there shooting pool um, with his D-line coach. He's been with him everywhere. And um, his one big strength coach, dude, who was awesome. And uh, – just great, great, great dude. And again, I was like, you know, I, I try to not be like ultra fanboy. I try to at least, you know, kind of accentuate that I know something about football. And I talked to him a little bit about you know, kind of the stuff that he did. And he could have been nicer. I mean, again, I, he probably thought I was some crazy idiot. But like I was, you know, just kind of like trying to get into the mind of a guy that is basically, he just does his own thing. He marches to the beat of his own drummer. Um, he's not scared to change things. And I appreciate that. Like I like guys that are innovative, think outside the box. And the biggest thing about Chip is he doesn't care what anybody says or what anybody does. And that's just his mentality. And I think that's the correct mentality for life because you know he wants to always make things better, wants things to make more sense. Um, you know, he, he's been real big in sports science. Uh, again, like he has the wacky thing where he doesn't practice on Thursday, but he practices like full speed on Friday. And every other football team in the entire universe does it the opposite in college football, where Thursday you have your, your last kind of walkthrough practice, and then Friday you take kind of the day off and you do like a super, super light walkthrough. Um, and Chip does it the opposite, which I thought was real interesting. But again, it's just um, a special dude. We're lucky to have him. Uh, I love what he's going to do with the run game. Again, I've watched about seven of his UCLA games from last year. His scheme's awesome. His, his O-line isn't great. Um, just from a talent perspective, uh, I think the Ohio State's offensive line is going to be much better. Uh, his running backs aren't nearly as good as he has at Ohio State this year. But, you know, two years ago when he had Dorian Thompson Robinson and Zach Charbonnet, like he was shredding the, the country. He was number one in the country in rushing. So I think that's about where we're going to be at this year with with his um, with him calling the plays and his scheme. Because he gets guys in into num numerical advantage matchups and he gets guys out in space better than anybody I've ever seen. And it's just like, it's like stealing. It's unbelievable how, how open he gets, guys, and, and I love it. Uh, Nevada, the Chip Kelly press conference was impressive. The Al Haig reference, and he also had a Beatles reference, which was also great. Uh, reference put the beat on notice that they are no match for the intelligence level upgrade. Tim May's hee-haw approach is benefiting of a Texas Tech fan base. Your thoughts on that, Nevada? Well, just first of all, Chip Kelly hates the media. Absolutely yes. hates the media. Yeah. No, but yes, yeah. he does. Oh my god. Yes, yes, he does. He, he he hates the media. So he loves to torment those guys. And so yeah, no, this is this is going to be one of the the uh, the undersold stories of the year. Is going to just be watching Chip kind of abuse the media guys mentally um, with his rapier wit and just the way that uh, he can be very biting, uh, you know, very sarcastic. But he doesn't have any time for fools and. Um, there's plenty of those guys on the beat. So he's, this is a target rich environment for chip. And, uh, he, he was loving it today. You could tell. Yeah. I, uh, I totally agree. He, uh, he's the guy that, you know, he's, he's the kind of guy that he'll be ultra friendly, but you know, behind the door, man, he, I mean, he hates those guys. And, and most coaches hate the media. It's because, you know, they're, they're the same guys that will smile on your face and Hey, Ryan, how's your coach? They'll absolutely crucify you after a stupid game, like the cotton bowl. And, and all those guys did it. I mean, I, there's receipts, there's podcasts, there's, I mean, it's just terrible. And again, I'm not saying you got to be a total fanboy, but 
there's a line. And a lot of those guys were diving way over the line on Ryan, which I thought was crazy. Um, and then Ryan Trezor has the best offseason in Ohio State history. So I hope he, like, wins the thing, wins the whole natty, and then he just tells all those guys to buzz off, all those, all you haters that were worried about a dumb cotton bowl that didn't mean anything. Jeremy Moreland, uh, appreciate you, my brother. Thank you for the 10. Uh, and thank you also for the Scoop Ultra membership. Excited to see these coasters. He's making us some coasters, in Nevada. Very excited about that. So how good is the duo of Downs slash Ransom going to be? Love the position. Miss the Mike Doss, Malik Hooker type safety. Ooh, I um, I think in modern college football, Malik's probably a better fit than Doss was. And I love Mike Doss. Mike Doss is from Canton McKinley. I grew up watching Canton McKinley. In 97, I moved to Canton, Ohio, the year that the, uh, the Canton McKinley Senior Bulldogs won the national championship. Not just the state championship, the national championship. Probably the best team in Ohio high school history. Um, and killer Mike Doss was a junior that year and they were awesome. And then in 08 or in 98, excuse me, he won the state championship again. So I love me some Mike Doss. Mike Doss is a beast. He's from Canton, three-time All-American, obviously represented. I don't know in modern college football, he's probably a linebacker just because of his, uh, he wasn't the fastest dude in the world. Um, he'd knock your block off. He'd kill you. Um, but you got to cover a lot of ground in modern football. Again, there's, there's some guys that unless they'd have to get smaller, quicker, like Schlegs, Schlegs, like when he played in 05, wouldn't be playing football today just because he was 255 and full of Budweiser and ranch dressing and chicken wings. And I mean, he'd kill you. He'd knock your block off. But, you know, if he was playing today, he'd probably be about 230 instead of 255. And that 25 pounds doesn't seem like a lot. But when you're playing middle linebacker, it's a lot. Um, I, uh, but I, I think like a guy like Malik, uh, Malik would be a perfect fit for modern college football. This duo of, of Downs Ransom, I think, is as good as we've had in a long time, uh, especially given that Caleb Downs is probably the best, might be the best defensive player in the country this year. Um, you know, Lathan, obviously, it was really good last year. We missed him significantly when we, when he got hurt and we had to play Sonny back there. Uh, it was something where people were excited to see Sonny in a more full time role. But I think that Lathan, um, you know, just the maturity, and I think his speed and his his ability to take angles and get guys on the ground was something we really missed. Sonny took some poor angles. It cost us. And I love Sonny Styles, but you know, being that big and playing safety isn't really a good mix, in my opinion. Um, I think these guys are going to be fantastic. Nevada, your thoughts on the Caleb Downs, Lathan Ransom duo? How good are they going to be this year? Well, I'm just you know really glad to see Lathan back out there. You know, it's you know with, you know coming off that injury. You know, it was, it, like you said, I was one of those people that was excited to see what Sonny could do. I was wondering if maybe it could be a blessing in disguise, and, and, it, and it wasn't. I mean, we really miss Lathan out there. Lathan's you know, a guy that's kind of underappreciated, always at the right spot. And um, just really great to see him going back out there. And Caleb Downs, I mean, again, what can you say about Caleb Downs? Let's take out the perhaps or whatever the disclaimer was you said about the defensive player. He is the best defensive player in the country and we have him for the next two years. And um, to have him, you know, <coughs> at, a, at a spot like that, it just takes, you know, it takes the safety thing from being a question. We'd be talking about that safety thing, you know, all spring football, all fall camp, you know, wondering about who was going to be that other safety with Caleb Downs there. Now it's just like, it's an embarrassment of riches. So I mean, that pair Caleb Downs and Lathan Ransom, you know, I'm not saying they're going to be better than anybody, you know, any combination of guys back there, but they're going to be as good. I mean, that's going to be, that's a really good pairing. And, um, you know, uh, that, that, that's a very, very talented group. And, they, and like I said, the good thing is they complement each other perfectly in terms of the way they play their strengths and, and, you know, relative weaknesses, you know, those slight that they are, but, uh, Caleb sure looks good in Ohio State, you know, problem. It was really good to see him out there today. Totally agree. Benji, thank you for the 10. Thank you for being a skip. I'll remember. Appreciate you, my man. With the fingers crossed, in case in a QB's running with Chip, do the strength and conditioning and rep management plans change to protect Howard and company? Any idea how the QBs feel about Chip so far? Spring ball is here. LFG, we know what that means, and we're excited about it as well. Um, I don't know if you can really protect these guys. You know, I, I think that... You know, my emphasis would be, and again, I'm I love running the quarterback. Is make sure these guys know how to slide. If they got to go over to the baseball facility and learn how to slide, yeah, I'd have them. 
I'd work on these guys sliding a lot. I tell them, you know, come out here, wear tights under your, your, your football pants. So you don't get strawberries all over your legs or slide all over this plastic grass that we're on. But I'd make sure they know how to slide. And again, I'm not in, I'm not in the business of these guys getting smoked by a big linebacker or a safety or whatever. I'm not in that business. I'm in the business of these guys going and getting free money, free yardage, and then just protecting themselves. You know, again, like I football's a game. It's a long season. Like I don't want wide receivers, you know, bulldozing safeties and having six guys tackle them. If they're get if they're in the grass, just fall on the ground and, and protect yourself. But again, call me a puss. I don't care. I want my guys to be healthy and make it to the championship game. I don't need them getting T-boned by somebody that while well, they're being held up by two other dudes. Like that's I think that's stupid football. Um, and those guys aren't really built for that kind of contact. So I don't want to see that. Um, and the quarterbacks love Chip. I mean, I mean, Chip is a guy. You know, when you look at what he did with Marcus Mariota, his first, you know, he was with Marcus his redshirt freshman year. Um, it, it, Chip's offense is very user friendly. I mean, he made Nick Foles at a Pro Bowler the one year he had him. Like Nick Foles looked like you know the, the second coming of you know John Elway when he had him for one year in Philly. So I I think that Chip is a guy. Uh, he um he wants his his system to be user friendly, easy, fun. He's kind of like. It's kind of like Apple, you know, like when you get an iPhone, like they don't make it super hard to use. They make it so that your 75 year old grandma can use it just as easy as a five year old can use it. That's what Chip Kelly's offense is. And at the same token, it's also powerful. It's excellent to use. Uh, you, you know, if you get to the deeper layers of it, it's like, you know, you, you could take the same Apple computer that your grandma sends emails on and you could, you know, build a spaceship with it, you know, with a, some sort of an engineering program. So it's like, it's that type of thing with his offense. So um, I think the deeper they get into the playbook and the more comfortable they, these guys get with the talent we have, it's going to go absolutely ballistic. And I'm excited for it. Uh, Nevada, your thought, uh, any idea on how the QBs feel about chip so far? Well, I mean, they're all excited. I mean, they're all excited. They, they know what they're kind of getting into and for Devin, for Will, for Lincoln, I'm mean, just really you know, plays to their strengths. You know, you're talking about kids that are, true dual threat quarterbacks, you know, at the various degrees of athleticism, you know, ranging from, I mean, Lincoln's a super freak. Will Howard's a tank and, and Devin loves to run the football and lower his shoulder. So now they're excited about it. They're excited about the triple option. They're excited about the kind of the pressure it puts on them to make decisions, make reads, but they know that they're, you know, they're a player on every play. So sometimes as a quarterback, you're just kind of the transport of the ball. Like you get the ball, you hand the ball off. This offense, man, you're making a lot of decisions, you know, you're on virtually every single play. And um, I, I think they're excited about the challenge and to have it a, you know, the, the greatest offensive mind in college football history as your offensive coordinator. I mean, look, it, it's a dream. It's a dream for us. It's certainly a dream for them as well. And uh, they know they're all going to benefit big time from from that association. Yeah, I absolutely, totally agree. Great question, Ben. Appreciate you, my man. Colin, uh, fourteen a day. Thanks for the deuce. W H to uh, Will Howard, twenty twenty five. Devin Brown, twenty twenty six. Jalen Sane, twenty twenty seven. Aaron Nolan, twenty twenty eight. Back to back to back first round picks. That's a little ambitious, but I like it. I like where your head's at. Um, that would be crazy. Um, you know, if Will went and then Devin went after his retro junior and then Julian Sane went after his junior and then Air went after his senior, it could happen. Um, I've seen a lot of things in life happen, but uh, that would be shocking to me. I think it'd be amazing, but anything could happen with Ryan Day again. Ryan Day put Haskins in, he put Fields in, he put CJ in. Um, you know, McCord broke the streak of all Big Ten quarterbacks that had been going since Braxton Miller, so. You know, that'd be amazing. I'd love it. I just, I don't know if, if those, if air will stick around for f basically four years without ever playing, uh, especially if Julian's only a first time starter. So that'll be real interesting. I, I just think that, you know, if Will starts this year and Devin sticks, you know, does the, the person that loses out of the Derby next year when it's Devin, Julian, St. Aaron Nolan and whatever freshman quarterback we get, um, did those guys all stick? Um, you know, cause you didn't even bring up Lincoln Keenholz, or I assume you think he's going to transfer, but uh, this is ambitious. I like it. I like this kind of optimism. Nevada, four straight first round picks. Could we do it? Uh, yeah, I mean, with Ryan Day and Chip Kelly, anything is certainly possible. Uh, in the age of the portal, will, will guys hang around long enough and have enough patience to do it? Um, maybe not, but maybe you change the names and it's uh, it's a different four. But 
I think every quarterback that steps into this this offense expects to be a uh, first round draft pick, and I think that's not a uh, you know that's not an unrealistic expectation. Yeah, I, uh, I totally agree. Uh, but great question, appreciate you, brother. Thank you for that. ZZM, thank you for the five. Thanks for being a super ultra member as well. Just me, or did Gamble catch that ball in the fourth quarter against Miami? I thought he did too. Uh, then the conf- the controversy wouldn't have mattered. Yeah, we get hosed on these bowl game calls because it's a lot like the um, Sean Wade play and some of the other stuff that we've seen go sideways in our uh, our time. You know, Joey Bosa getting ejected against Notre Dame. We've had some bad bowl game calls. I don't know if it's because these other conferences hate us or what it is. But, um, you know, I uh, I don't know. I, I think that it, I'm just like, I'm glad we won that game. But I thought he caught that ball. Nevada, do you remember that play? We thought... Uh, the gamble caught the ball uh, oh, in the fourth quarter. Well, yeah, of course. I mean, he, he definitely caught it. It should have never gone to all the drama that followed it. Um, but hey, it, it did. We have a great story. And and you, what you have to remember is, is, as an Ohio State fan, is the Miami fans are absolutely tormented by that late flag yes. and the whole double overtime and stuff like that. So come on, you're like I'm just so glad that it went the way that it did. Because just a you know a boring choke him out kind of win he catches that for the first down we run the clock out would not have been nearly as satisfying as this for years they feel like they had it stolen from them so for me it all worked out the way it's supposed to and it made it just that much sweeter. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I'm excited about it. Um, it's uh, again it ended the dynasty. Miami's dead. They've been dead ever since they came ended, and it was absolutely fantastic job site. So, Johnny, thank you for the five. Talk about Clemson sign stealing in 2020. We huddled more to combat that. And finally, we beat them and started their decline. Yes, we did. Why weren't they investigated? That's a great question. Um, you know, uh, um, I mean, Brett Venables was like, it was like, uh, he was like Superman when Superman lost his powers and he got knocked out at that diner and he's bleeding all over the place. Like, that's what Venables is like when he couldn't steal signs. All of a sudden, he's immortal. And again, like, the sign stealing. I think is addicting to these coaches because if they have a system in place where they're stealing the signs, they're getting the signs, they're getting basically like they're basically cheating at, you know, golf or poker or whatever. Like when all of a sudden they become mere mortals, it really looks terrible. And that's what happened to Brent Venables and Clemson hasn't been the same since Nevada. Your thoughts on that. Um, It is interesting. They never got investigated, but I remember like Ryan day, like, went through great lengths leading into that Clemson game to cover the signals, change the signals, mix the signals. Cause again, it's a dangerous game if you're going to pick signals, because if you don't get them right and you're calling stuff off of a, a, a bluff signal or whatever, it could get real hairy real quick and you could look really bad. Um, as opposed to just calling the game clean, but, uh, thank God the, the electronics, the comms are going into the headsets, the communications that's going to eliminate a lot of this, but your thoughts on that Nevada. Well, look, everybody steals signs to some one degree or another. It's just, you know, it's, do you do this? Do you do that? You know, that part of it, that's where the Michigan fans have got it right. But nobody hired stringers to go out and film 36 different games with little cameras and matches. I mean, that's, that, again, it's just the difference. So, you know, Venables was good at it. Uh, Venables, whether he was picking them in games or picking them off the TV thing or whatever, but just, you know, Michigan took a decent idea and just went way hog wild with it. And that's why they're going to get hammered. But, uh, yeah, Venables hasn't been the same sense of signals, but you know, it's, it just, like I said, it's just, it's one of those unspoken things. You can get away with doing it to a certain degree, but what Michigan did was so far over the line that they have to be punished. And that that's what they have to understand is the punishment fits the crime. And the, the crime was really, really bad. Oh yeah. It was, it was terrible. Uh, Gio did it. Thanks for the five. Appreciate it. Let's just say the obvious Caleb Downs and JJ Smith look like seniors getting ready for the draft. My goodness. They look amazing at first glance. Yeah. JJ has been putting in work for a long time. So he's like him, him looking like Julio Jones doesn't surprise me at all. Again, the kid works with his per, a really good personal trainer in Miami um, you know, his, uh, his, his cousin is Gino Smith who plays for the Seahawks and, you know, played at West Virginia, had a great career at West Virginia, made a, a nice big extension with the Seahawks. Um, Caleb, you know, again, I think that these guys that kind of know the NFL and see the path to the NFL are different. 
Um, you know, I, I've said multiple times here, Caleb Downs, his dad was a great player in the NFL. Gary Downs played a long time. Uh, his brother, Josh Downs, is a rookie, was a rookie for the Colts. So when it, it, it's not like it's new money. It's not like it's they don't know how to get there, the work it takes, the amount of uh, discipline it takes to be a great player. Um, and I think that that's something that both these guys have. You know, JJ, again, you know, his, uh, his cousin is Geno Smith. Um, they've got a lot. They've, you know, South Florida Express has been around. The good thing about being on a South Florida Express is you're exposed to Zay Flowers and Amari Cooper and Teddy Bridgewater. And those coaches have coached like first, like first round picks that have made hundreds of millions of dollars in the NFL. Um, so, you know, they, they can kind of give you like real guidance. It's not like, you know, when, you know, Brett Guess is, is coaching JJ Smith for South Florida Express. Like JJ is the first good player he's ever seen. Cause sometimes that's how it is. Like sometimes like, you know, a high school coach gets a kid and uh, you know, at a public school and he's never had a player as good as a certain kid. But when you're at South Florida Express, man, it's like every year they have like Jamie French um, and, and, and uh, Vernell Brown are, th those guys are both going to be Buckeyes in all likelihood. Um, I think it's Vernell Brown or something like that, but they're, those guys are nasty monstrous athletes uh and they love ohio state so the pipeline is going to continue but uh nevada your thoughts um from geo did it uh let's just say the obvious caleb downs and jj swift look like seniors getting ready for the draft am i good let's see, look amazing at first glance yeah they're, they're both three and out guys uh basically from day one yeah no i mean they're impressive i mean judkins is another guy that you just look at and you're just like Oh my gosh. I mean, that, that kid, it's, you know, it, it's amazing that he was a three star kind of unheralded kid coming out of Alabama, uh, ends up at Ole Miss. And, um, I mean, my goodness, he was, uh, an impressive young man. And we talked about Edric Houston, but yeah, these, these guys are coming, they're, they're, you know, with, with training, getting the way that it is and specialized nutrition. And, um, you know, freshmen don't look like freshmen anymore. And, and these guys are definitely special. They're next breed, but this entire Ohio State group, is just uber athletic, and that's probably the hallmark of the team. Is how athletic the, this group is. Um, I, I've never seen anything quite like it. It's 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 kind of stunning, to be honest with you. Yeah, and that's like the fun thing is like you know these kids get um um some guy uh, some of these guys you know, they got the right trainers they got the right uh, they got the right attitude they're getting into diet um, that's the thing these kids get there they actually get on good diets they're not eating you know, Pringles for dinner. Cause again, like when you're a high school kid, I used to eat like Whopper juniors every night and, you know, uh, Funyuns and just like trash. And like you get to college, you're like, Oh, we can actually like, you get a dietitian. And that's, that's been blown up by urban. Cause when, when we were with trust, we had no dietitian, but now it's like these kids, they're not just eating slim gyms and Mountain Dew every night for dinner. Because you know, when you're in high school and you're burning 7,000 calories a day. You can eat whatever you want. But all of a sudden, when you start eating right, you're like, wow, these workouts are way easier to do because I'm not eating trash. But um, it's always kind of eye-opening because, you know, like this is part of being a high school kid and being a kid. Um, Tony Turley, my man, appreciate you. I got to send you a hat too. Appreciate you, my man. Thanks for the 20. Uh, thank you for all of uh, our great talks. We've had a lot of them recently. Uh, thank you for being a scoop. I'll just remember, Kirk, <laughs> did Trestle tell the players to always say, sir, when speaking with the refs, um, I don't think so. I mean, I I remember some guys have gone ballistic on the officials before. Um, I the only time I ever there there's two times I, I went crazy on officials, and both times involved me getting clipped, AKA blocked in the back um, on interception returns. It happened once when we played LSU, um, and I, I got I got completely clipped. I mean, it was it was the most obvious clip in the history of football. And the douchebag official didn't do anything. And I got clipped for San Diego State in 05. And it was like, it, and like, and I, I said stuff that probably should have got me ejected because it was just so bad. It was so obvious. It's such a dirty play. And both times it was the same thing as a D end who I was smacking him around in the game. And he, and he had a shot at me because you know, you know, I'm running to go you know, get the guy on the ground. Um, you know, he picked off the pass and, you know, and, and, and you get a kill shot and they got, and it wasn't like one where it like, it didn't like hurt me, but like when it's an illegal block, it's like, I mean, come on guys, you bunch of douchebags. Um, and I said stuff way worse than that to those guys. Cause I was heated. Um, you know, cause again, like, I don't mind getting hit. I don't mind getting blocked, but if it's an illegal block, I have a big problem with that. Cause again, it's like, it'd be like if I was blocking a guy and I dove at the back of his legs, which is, you know, that's illegal. Um, you can't roll at the back of a guy's legs. That's that's a uh, um, 
or if I high low guy and, and chop block of like that's illegal. Like I didn't, I never blocked guys illegally. You know, I you know, obviously I got a few holding calls in my career, but like I never like a, a blatant dirty block or hit. Like like it, blocking guy in the back from behind is dirty, um, and it happened twice. But I did not say sir. Um, I said a lot of words that probably were the exact opposite of sir. But I was always polite to the the officials. It was funny. One of my math teachers in high school, her husband was a Big Ten official, and I used to always see him out there. Um, great dude. Uh, obviously, didn't help me with any calls, but I uh, I always had a lot of respect for the officials because it is literally the worst job in the entire universe uh, because everybody hates you no matter what you do. So again, I don't know why those guys do it, but they get paid well, so they must be doing it for that reason. But um, Tress would say, sir, um, but sometimes I don't think it matters, and, and sometimes. We had a, we had officiating crews that hated us, and we knew it. And when we saw that they they had the game, like the, the crew that we had for the Illinois game hated us in that game that we lost in 07, and we knew that. And again, I'm not saying that's why we lost, but there were some guys. There was this one old guy that just hated us. He never gave us a call, never called holding against our, uh, the opposing O line. It was crazy, but um, yeah, he didn't always uh, he didn't always say, but you have trust. I mean, trust doesn't swear very much, but you know when trust swears, it's effective because it's so rare. Um, and it's kind of shocking, but it is also, it's also awesome to hear trust swear. It's one of my favorite things ever. Uh, Larry Daniels, the first, or, uh, Larry Daniels one, excuse me. Thanks for being a scoop. I'll remember. Thank you for the five. What will be the cutoff time on helmet communication action? I imagine it's probably 25 to 30 before the play, uh, on the play clock. Will there still be secondary hand signals to just absolutely. There's still going to be signaling folks. Just because you have comms doesn't mean that there's not going to be hand signal because if a team goes warp speed, if, if Chip Kelly, because Chip Kelly's probably like licking his chops right now, he's probably like, "Ooh boy, these guys think that you're going to get to use comms. I'm going to go warp speed, hyperdrive. The I'm going to go ludicrous speed, like in Spaceballs, the entire game. Because then you have to go back to signaling the whole time. So, you know, I I, I think the comms will be more of a an additive than the main course. I think that you know these guys still have to be adapted at signaling and changing signals everywhere because. If a team goes, you know, fastball, all of a sudden, man, you, you got to go right back to signaling. Um, Nevada, your thoughts? I think the cutoff time will be 25, 30 seconds before the snap. Uh, do you think there's still going to be uh, secondary uh, hand signals? Yeah, I, there, I think there has to be. But your thoughts on that? Yeah, yes and yes and yes. I mean, I, I, I'm not sure it will be 25 or 30. I, I think it it might be shorter than that. Um but let me let me check. I'll, I can get that. I can get the exact number on that. But yeah, you know, hand signal would definitely be a part. Um, I need to give you the hand signal right now that my phone is absolutely melting. So you're gonna have to. I mean, like I'm literally on. I'm getting that flashing red thing right there where they're going. My phone is overheating. So you're gonna have to carry the uh, the show the rest of the way there. Um, I apologize if, if it cools off. I'll log back on. Oh. You get your jitterbug on fire. I love it. Well, uh, well it's a good time to wrap this thing up. Uh, any final thoughts, Nevada? Uh, no, just no, just a great day. You know, love the first day of spring. You know, spring football. Uh, really impressive looking group of, of Ohio State Buckeyes. Um, and you know, for you guys listening to the podcast, if you can leave us a like, it helps us so much. Helps other people find the podcast. Just hit that little. I know it's kind of hard sometimes. Just move the little cursor over and hit that little thumbs up thing really helps out. Uh, Kirk and I helps out the podcast and we appreciate it very much. Absolutely. Well, thank you guys so much. Great show tonight. Again, spring ball is marching along as we get into, uh, they got a couple more practices in spring break and the guys get to get out of Dodge for a little bit. So that'll be really good. Uh, again, if you guys enjoyed this content, please leave us a like, click subscribe. Also click through the little ball. The thing I challenge you guys to do is send it to some of your friends. If you guys have friends that are Buckeye fans, um, the word of mouth has been fantastic. A lot of people um, are following the show, uh, loving the show. So again, we appreciate all of the love that we are getting. The merchandise drop is coming in the next week or two. Uh, I should have some words on that very quickly. Um, but I just really am super, super excited about uh, the direction of the show and all of the stuff you guys are doing with us. Again, it's going to be awesome. The year is also going to be slick. I think it's going to look uh, really, really sharp and you guys are going to love it. Got a couple super chats here. So I'm going to knock these out. Apologize. Beach Buck, thank you uh, for the five. Uh, right at the buzzer. Big Daddy and Pace, both went number one overall. Who wins that battle? Orlando all day, every day. Big Daddy said two more years of eligibility. He's been the best combo ever. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, but Orlando is the best player in school history. Big Daddy I, is not quite in the conversation because he didn't have quite the NFL career, but 
he was a force, obviously. If you go one overall in the draft, you're a monster. Uh, thank you for that, Beach Buck. That's a great question. Jeremy Morley, thanks for the deuce. Jitterbug, that is Nevada's phone. It melts uh, when we are on the podcast, but I do it on my computer, so it never melts, and it's nice and cool. Um, but again, I appreciate you guys so much. This was a great episode, big episode, because you guys made it one, as always. Um, in the comments, I want to hear, what are your spring game plans? Are you guys getting together? Are you guys doing anything? Would you guys be interested in a scoop meetup? Because I'm getting a lot of questions about that, but I want to see what is the interest level of a scoop meetup. Because maybe we do it, maybe we don't, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Um, and again, uh, keep letting me know how you guys watch the show. It helps me if you guys are on computer, iPhone, iPad, whatever. Uh, however you, uh, you digest the information, it's always helpful to know. And if you guys could give us a follow on uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify for our audio version, or if some of you guys like to you know, do it, you know, listen to it in the gym, during your commute, the audio version is excellent for that. So uh, even if you like the YouTube, if you could just follow those, those are also huge big benefactors for the site. So we appreciate you guys so much. I hope you guys have a great rest of your night. Thank you so much, Buckeye Nation. Thank you, Scoop family. Football is here. Better get on BuckeyeScoop.com because that's where I'm heading right now for the rest of the night. So I hope you guys have a good one. Go Bucks.